Um, my Excellent. My name is uh, Tim Evans, and I'm professor of business and political economy at Middlesex University. And I'm delighted to welcome you here this evening to this uh, online distinguished uh, lecture. Um, it's a huge honor and an absolute delight uh, to introduce our guest speaker tonight. But before I do so, can I start by uh, thanking all my brilliant colleagues at Middlesex University for supporting and making these distinguished lectures the success uh, that they have become. In particular, can I thank Christiana for all her amazing marketing, administrative and diplomatic skills and support. These events are made all the better because of her input and I cannot thank her enough. Um, can also thank uh, my colleague Anna Kiprianu for her ongoing and visionary support, as well as our brilliant colleagues, people like Kim Raymond and others, uh, who are always encouraging behind the scenes. Right, um, I've known John now for several years, and where can I start? Um, John is a very good friend, uh, and uh, like me, uh, he's recently lost uh, his father, um, and we were talking yesterday in preparation for this, uh, the things that all that, that throws up. Um, John is an African-American by background, uh, when he was younger, uh, he was a highly accomplished athlete, and he's gone on to become a brilliant scholar, writer, and academic. Uh, he is now a professor uh, living here in the UK. Um, he's also a family man, and he is married, I believe, to a German woman. Unlike many Americans, unlike many Americans, uh, he has lived and worked in all corners of Europe over many years. Uh, I think you've lived in all kinds of places on the continent for quite some time. And you've also done a lot of teaching uh, and consulting uh, in the Middle East in countries like Oman. Oman uh, is a country I've also been to, and we talked about that. Um, and I know you're extremely popular out there as well. Uh, for me, John combines a rich tradition, perhaps better recognized in countries like Germany, uh, of the practitioner scholar. Um, he's a person who has been there, he's experienced it, he's thought about it, and he's gone on to use all manner of academic frameworks, concepts, uh, and second order constructs to uh, gain depth, altitude, and powerful insights and reflections. So John, you have been um, hugely active um, uh, uh, in recent times, you've, you've written a lot, you, you have a new book out that was out a little while ago. We were hoping, weren't yes. we, to do this talk uh, last year in person, physically at the university, but lockdown got in the way. Here we are. I promised you yes. that, that we would do this. Um, it, it is an absolute delight to have you. Um, one of the things I'm hugely grateful for you for, because you're a professor and a professor in practice, is for the pioneering role you've taken with the Chartered Association of Business Schools in bringing a national network of professors in practice together. So without further ado, and to go to the formal title of this talk, The Perfect Storm in Sports 4.0, today's leadership is not enough for tomorrow's problems. One plea is, I wonder, John, before you get into the meat of your subject, and I know you're gonna talk yes. for 20 or 30 minutes, if you could share with us, because it is extraordinary, a little bit about your background, your journey, before you get into the, the scholarly stuff. So, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Um, thank you so much. Um, and again, I'd like to express my gratitude to Middlesex University. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the invitation and to everyone out there uh, as well. I know you're in part, different parts of the uh, world, different time zones. Uh, you're probably going into Zoom fatigue or out of, depending on where you are. But uh, uh, let's start. Um, very top line, My, because some of the audience uh, knows me for uh, leadership mindsets in, in different industries, uh, and they might not make the, the, exactly the connection. Uh, so, so very briefly with sport, born in Denver, Colorado. At four years old, I'm on skis. At 10 years old, I'm racing. Uh, my coaching, my coach got me into something called dry land training to 
maintain the, the physical activity uh, when the season wasn't on. And I got into uh, tennis and cycling. Uh, subsequently in tennis, I was ranked, I got good and ranked uh, number one in doubles, but that's not saying much in Colorado because you can only play tennis three months out of the year. <laughs> so I was playing against, uh, I played sometimes against, you know, people from Florida and Arizona and, and, and California. My matches would be done like this in 20 minutes. Uh, when I left ski racing and tennis, I went to the University of Colorado Boulder and Boulder at that time and, and is now, it's a, it's a complete mecca for uh, professional sports. Um, so I trained and rubbed shoulders with the cyclists from the 7-Eleven team, the first team, uh, national, U.S. national team. I uh, also uh, with the first uh, individuals who started the Ironman in Hawaii. So Dave Scott, uh, Mike Pig. Uh, Scott Tinley, uh, Scott Molina, um, you know, world-class swimmers where I remember one time I was working out in the gym with weights and there's the world number one and two free world climbers uh, coming up to me and going, oh, if you, if you do a weight like this, it's not going to hurt your muscles. It was, it was, and then you go for runs in clubs and you'd see uh, Rosa Moda, Alberto Sal Salazar, and a, an incredible, uh, 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 environment to be steeped in. I, I, I burnt out of that and I left uh, for Europe and uh, for a, a student exchange in, in Spain. And, I, uh, and then I went to do my master's in, in, in the Netherlands, moved to Barcelona, uh, where I was doing some consulting uh, for about eight, 10 years, moved up to uh, the UK. And I met, in, that's 2005, and I met a very prominent figure in the performance coaching industry, Miles Downey. He wrote a book, second best book, uh, uh, most selling book in, in, um, in executive coaching called Effective Coaching. And this is where the crisis begins and where the, 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 the idea of the mindsets uh, come in and leadership. We visited uh, and delivered into many organizations and industries, including sport. And I was, I had this dilemma because every single organization and including in sport, so we would go to, you know, professional clubs, they had a different definition for performance. Everyone did. And they would use different methodologies and different training techniques and different approaches, as well as leadership. And I became confused. And so there starts my dilemma and uh, really exploration into uncovering why uh, why leaders think differently, why uh, performance is considered differently in the US to, to the UK. I mean, there's a huge difference. It may not seem like that on the surface level, but massive difference, especially if you go to college. Uh, uh, we talk, I talk a lot about the, the college system in the US. There's none other like the college system in the world. Billions, billions of dollars in revenue. Um, and, and you go to other countries and it doesn't exist, but there that is a life condition, particular life condition of that country. So this is where, um, this is where we start. And, and um, if I'll share the screen the moment, can you see the screen? Yes? Yes. Excellent. So great. And it, as I said at the end of the uh, uh, exploring and, and why sports leadership mindsets, uh, mindsets are different, it culminated in this book, Games You Can Play, Experience the Meaning of Winning. And it's a systems view uh, using science of Dr. Claire Graves, a commercial application of Dr. Dom Beck, uh, and really taking this framework uh, into different sports environments to understand complexity, change, and problem solve. And this is where we are, where we are in the perfect storm. And it's one of, the, uh, one of the approaches you can take to understand complexity in sports and a perfect storm is heading our way. <laughs> uh, and this is insights into why today's leadership is not enough to solve tomorrow's problems. I'm gonna start off with this date because 
Thursday, March 25th, 2020, as Tim said, this was the date that I was supposed to be at Middlesex uh, uh, University and uh, in a large auditorium uh, to deliver this very subject, but it was canceled uh, due to the global pandemic. And I remember receiving a, a message from Professor Evans. <clears throat> Matter of fact, it was the same day as we joked that Sir Paul McCartney and uh, uh, Taylor Swift were also canceled uh, about the, the cancellation of, uh, uh, of, of the distinguished lecture. And I had just stepped off a plane from developing leaders in the Middle East. Uh, as I said before, I help leaders uh, develop capacities and capabilities to effectively lead in the fourth industrial revolution with skills like making sense of complexity, leading and managing through change and solving problems. Now I have to be truthful with you. Some of the leaders pre-pandemic found it really hard to understand this environment. They, they thought it was happening somewhere else, maybe some galaxy far, far away, but also the value of having these skills was hard to understand. I, I mean, look, look at these skills, uh, making sense of complexity, uh, leading and managing through change, solving difficult problems. These are, these are soft skills. But throughout the pandemic, I start to get a, a slow tsunami of calls and emails with people asking me questions and saying, listen, I really understand 4.0 now and the value of the skills. So if you in the audience are a leader in sports, my question is, do you understand the importance? And if you don't, maybe you're living in another galaxy far away, or perhaps you think that sports is different from other sectors, but it is not. So my intention really is to help raise awareness so leaders in sport can be effective and do the things that they need to do within leadership, organize, operate, perform, direct, develop, manage, train, compete, and yes, why not win? I will raise awareness in three areas. We will explore what is sports 4.0 exactly, why the pain and impact on leadership, and how to prepare and shift leadership mindset to effectively lead in that environment. After each section, we are really, I'm, I'm really interested to, to understand what the audience is thinking. So we're gonna take a poll uh, and we will cover those uh, uh, answers in the Q and A post presentation. So let's start, what is Sports 4.0? The fourth industrial revolution in business and industry, uh, for a lot of people, including myself, uh, it's super cool, right? There's technology, artificial intelligence, breakthroughs. In fact, there is a program on CNN called Saved by the Future, where it looks at how technology will enhance our lives. But I am afraid that the 4.0 environment is a lot less glossy with a lot more pain. The scientific fundamentals of sports 4.0 or any industrial revolution is a shift in life conditions. Have you noticed if you are a leader that leading or managing, directing and performing is getting more difficult or perhaps even winning may feel like you're throwing the dice, right? What you are experiencing are elements within life conditions that are shifting. For example, race, ecology, gender, threats, resources, social class, wild cards. And what happens is that these elements press against or impact a leader's mindset. And what a leader needs to do is adapt to the conditions. 
Now I'm going to take a short poll and I would be really interested in your answers. Sports 4.0 is a completely new environment. What are your expectations for the pace of change? One, accelerated. Two, normal. Or three, not much change at all. I will give you uh, some minutes to answer that. And Christina, uh, you can tell me when to continue. Okay, great. We're doing really well. We've had 12 people engaged so far, all 13. Just as we get closer to the 24, I will close it. 19, 20. Thanks guys for engaging. We're really grateful. Fantastic. Okay, we'll just give it another 10 seconds and then I'll close it. Okay, just about to close now. Okay, so it has come back, accelerated change. Not much change at all. Okay, great. See, nothing's in the middle, so that's very interesting. Excellent, let's continue. Thank you very much, Christina. Now, we have looked at, uh, we have looked at Sports 4.0. We know that that's change. Now we're looking at why the pain and impact, and mainly because change causes problems. We are at an unprecedented time in the sports industry to experience complexity and change. Over the past three industrial revolutions, sports has developed systems and structures performance systems, management systems, league tables, championships, uh, financial models, the list goes on. And as these systems and structures build, they accumulate problems. That's, that's no problem because typical problems are normal, but unsolved problems continue along and become unsolved. When you accumulate a large amount of unsolved problems in a system, it creates a perfect storm. And a perfect storm is a rare combination of circumstances that combines to drastically aggravate an event. If you remember that table, we had the table of change and those elements. These are the circumstances that combine to drastically aggravate an event. And you might've experienced a perfect storm yourself uh, maybe on the beach or, or, or jogging or walking in the woods. First, there's a bit of, there's stability. Then there is instability followed by literally disruption and sometimes complete chaos. This is exactly what is taking place in the sports industry at the moment. Complexity, accelerated change and difficult problems to solve. There are many perfect storms in sports at the moment. Take your pick. There is gender, medical, science, race, doping, management. If you type perfect storm in sport or perfect storm and your particular sport into any search engine, you will find a list uh, of perfect storms that are, are here and now, or, and that's some that are emerging on the horizon. Uh, many people think that COVID is a perfect storm and, and it's not, it's a change accelerator. So it accelerates change and it exposes unsolved problems and it actually creates new problems multiplied two by four times. Now, I'm interested in your thoughts on change. Change causes problems, as we know. How is your sport or industry coping with problem solving? Do you think it's one coping effectively, coping normally, or not coping well at all? Christiana, I'll help hand it over to you. Hey, thanks everybody again. We're really grateful if you um, 
engage in our poll so we can see what your thoughts are. Brilliant, we've got 11 so far. 15. 18, 19. Brilliant, we'll just give it another couple of seconds and then we'll stop. Great. Okay, we'll stop there. Okay, so we have 52% uh, not coping well, 29% coping normally, uh, 24 coping effectively. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and it'd be interesting to find out what coping effectively is. Uh, I'd be very interested in that. Great. Thank you so much, Christiana. <clears throat> now the third part to explore how to prepare and shift leadership mindset. We, we know what sports 4.0 with uh, sports 4.0 is, which is change. We know why the pain and impact, which is because of problems. With those two, we can begin to prepare and shift our leadership mindset to effectively lead capacity wise. Now, you're probably wondering why I didn't say capability, because capability is about performance and it's about winning. But in this 4.0 environment, capacity is going to be equally important as capability or if not more important. And it's it's important that you understand and be clear about capacity and capability. They both make a sports leader's mindset, but the quality of the mindset it will determine if you can solve problems, understand complexity, and lead and manage through change. And let me explain why briefly. We have four cups equally distributed across the page, right? This is a continuum of time and each cup has a 10 year gap. If we look at one particular place in time, which is beginning of 10 years, we have volume in this cup, which are capacities. Capacities deployed at a specific place in time is performance because you get a result. And the remaining part of this cup is potential to add more in the continuing years. Now, let me put this into context of sports leadership. We introduce change. We know change causes problems. So a leader needs to adapt by developing capacities year after year. If they don't, it causes problems. If the environment is a 40-year capacity and capability, and actually a coach has a 20-year, you can see the gap here, right? There is a deficit. If you've heard of old school coaching in the new world, this is exactly it. Using old capacities and capabilities, trying to get the best you can out of a team or out of a, 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 a sports business, right? But it has diminishing returns. This means two things. The first is that over time, the weight or importance of leadership performance to achieve results becomes less of a deciding factor as the need for leadership capacity increases. And secondly, over time, the quality of leadership performance to achieve results is going to depend more on leadership capacity. That's depth and volume. The trademark of 20th century sports business and industry was capability. It was about performance and results. And this is great. And, and, and I'm all for it. I love competition. But there is a, there's a warning for leaders in sport. Because of the accelerated pace of change and complexity, leaders will have to rely on more, rely more on capacity building, that volume and depth and scope of knowledge. So this is a call to action for all you leaders and leaders in sport to acquire cognitive abilities and brain-based skills for this 4.0 environment. Now, I know some of you, if we could turn on the volume, uh, some of you in sport would be laughing at the moment saying, this professor is crazy. 
cognitive abilities and brain-based skills. Sports is not business, but you will be surprised that sports are now introducing the idea of studying business leadership and management skills along with the technical, tactical, and technical aspects of a sport. Uh, this is an example of a player development project. It's a great resource for coaches in English football. They're based in Australia. Uh, and I took this off the blog uh, when they were recommending what should coaches study or what should they do to develop themselves. These are business skills. Now, these cognitive abilities and brain-based skills seem to be common among other industries uh, uh, and, and organizations, and they seem to coalesce in, to about nine skills rec uh, recommended by the World Economic Forum for Next Generation Leadership. And these skills are active learning and learning strategies, uh, creative originality and initiative, critical thinking and innovation, complex problem solving, leadership and social influence, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision-making, people management and cognitive flexibility. The last poll, I'm very interested in your thoughts on cognitive abilities and brain-based skills in the 4.0 environment to effectively lead. How well do you think leadership in your business and industry is prepared? Do you think it's prepared and ahead of the curve, just maintaining, or not prepared and behind the curve. Over to you, Christiana. So we've had 20 people vote. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, I think I'll, oh, 21, perfect. I think I'll end polling. Okay. Not prepared and behind the curve, 55%. Just maintaining 36, 9% prepared and ahead of the curve. Excellent. Um, very interesting numbers as well. It, it, it'd be really interesting to speak around these percentages and find out what they are specifically. Excellent. We have two more slides he heading into uh, the end here. When you next step into your leadership role, I would like to, you to think about <clears throat> this quote. The possibility for a player, team, or sports organization to grow, develop, and perform to their full potential is never greater than the quality of its leadership. The quality is mindset, capacities and capabilities, and the leadership is yourself. I have been speaking a lot about sports leadership mindsets, and this is a brief introduction. A brief introduction. The science, there's a theory, a framework, principles, and application to sports leadership mindsets uh, where you can understand complexity, lead and manage, manage through change, uh, and solve problems. Uh, this is all in my book, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And can I remember uh, remind you to use your gray matter wisely, as I always say. <laughs> John, that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, it, it, it's fascinating for me whenever uh, I go uh, before a class, um, I always say that one of the benefits of being a professor is it's not just what you think and what you say, you often learn, of course, from 
the students themselves. And I was in a class with some um, brilliant Indonesian students a couple of years ago. And within two minutes, one of the students said something that was very clever, it was very profound. And I simply sat down, um, uh, which they had never experienced back in Indonesia when a professor just sits down. <laughs> as well that was really good right. you know and kind of they were on duty for that minute and uh, as you know <laughs> better than most people i'm not the world's most sporty of people um and it's in that context that i am indeed sitting down humbly because i really learned something there um and it sounds really dumb and i don't mind sounding dumb occasionally because they made me a professor <laughs> and I, i'm quite happy to say you know i've made a mistake or whatever but it is ridiculous, isn't it? I, uh, through you and through listening to you and through learning from you, you, I just step back and I reflect on just what an enormous business so many sports have become. When I was a kid growing up in the 60s or the early 70s and my parents or grandparents, you know, my grandparents came from the, the 1890s, you know, at a time where right. actually things like football were relatively young really um but it's become such you know an enormous business so many sports have and you think about the training the facilities the sponsorships the advertising uh you know, even in cycling just the technology of bikes uh yeah. you know and, and the kind of materials they're made of the implications are of course vast um and so thank you so much because you really have raised my gaze to think about this subject uh, through uh, fresh, uh, 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 fresh glasses. Um, Great. Um, we're going to turn to um, we're going to turn to the questions from people, but let me just ask you to reflect on that. Um, sport really has become big business, hasn't it? It is huge in America, but it's global. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, I think what's interesting about that is they are, the expressions are different uh, in different countries. So we have, um, we have the US, which, as I say, always has this enormous amateur system. It's a, it's a literally, it's a conveyor belt. So you, which is very clear for, for an athlete um, and actually for a coach as well. If you, you start in high school, uh, there, there, are, there are areas in, for example, Texas in the South that are steeped in uh, football. They have their, high schools have their own cable network that just, uh, uh, you know, an old cable network that, 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 that just produced the, these games that show the games. Um, so you have these, you yeah, have high school and you know that you can get a scholarship going into college, right? And then from there into the pros, of course, the percentages are very small, but even to have that as a potential, uh, uh, potential outlet, right? Or, or potential opportunity, that's interesting as a player, but just think about the systems that support that. Coaches, uh, um, um, you know, all types of uh, instructors, technical instructors, rehabilitation, uh, you have all these systems around this, and it, it is, it's, uh, uh, that's what I call about, that's what we, what I'm talking about, system capacity. There yeah. are, uh, and if you look at the, the women's soccer team in the U.S., uh, you know, they're very dominant. Women's soccer has been played for, I mean, ages in the U.S., has, it's just coming professional, but it was played in, in you know, uh, college, uh, you know, even when I was going to college, you know, in, in the 80s and, and, and even before that in the 70s. And they have a depth on the bench that is just incredible because they have this conveyor belt. They have a very, and you go to other places around the world and there's not really a, a, a visible way or visible path to, to acquire that. If that, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, one of the things you and I have discussed, and we've got questions coming and I encourage people to put questions because I'm going to be turning to them very shortly. But one of the things that I know concerns you and, and, uh, and, and it concerns me um, 
is, for example, the whole issue of BAME communities and yeah. to what extent, even if you do make it big in sport and there can be huge sums of money uh, attached to making it big, to what extent are you prepared for the kind of the riches, the stardom, you know, the whole psychological um, baggage that can come with that? And, you know, business might be good and you might have uh, elements of good management and leadership but when it comes to pastoral care or looking after people yes. I mean I think there are moments where to put it in a British context you, some of the things you say and others say uh, means we're almost living in in those areas almost in a Dickensian world where people really are not looked after um, yeah and the oh, oh um, absolutely and and I'll go back to the college system where it's gotten so big. I, I think the NCAA, uh, National College Athletic, this is an association for college athletics. It's supposed to watch over the, the athletes and it has a double billion dollar revenue. Double billion dollar. If you can get your head around that, right? And we have, you have athletes that are graduating, going you know, uh, to schools like Notre Dame, uh, really, exclusive schools on scholarships, but they don't graduate with reading skills. They don't graduate with mathematics skills because the system wants performance and it's built around that. It's built around, you know, if you're a, a college, if you're a college university and your, your revenue is on just on ticket sales for games is seven to 10 million a year, you want the best athletes for entertainment, showtime, for, for winning. And it, it, it's the system in the US has taken precedent, precedence over human care. So uh, again, I think I was talking to you about uh, uh, John Mount, um, great coach in the US who, is, who has coached uh, uh, high school and uh, NCAA division one, which is the best division and, um, and NFL, uh, some wonderful interviews and documentaries about how these athletes are slipping through the systems, um, mental health issues, concussion issues. Uh, it's really sad. And, and this is going to become a perfect storm. Yeah. It's going to become a perfect, it is a perfect storm now, but, uh, 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 and, and the question is, is there the capacity there to really solve the problem? Yeah, and I can see that with the start and the fame, the money at the ticket, etc., there's almost also a conspiracy of silence, isn't it? Because the interests involved are so powerful. Uh, you have yes. people yeah. who are reputedly educators, but so yes. dependent for their brand on the success of these individuals that however much they're exploited, um, your point about not being able to do mathematics or reading, um, it, you know, and so there is a kind of putting it in British terms, there's almost a sort of Victorian scandal brewing there. It, it amazes me, to be blunt with you, that we don't have more publicity on this and that this is kind of not, I don't know, I mean, you know, in US terms, on the front page of, um, of, of the New York Times every day, you know, and, and you, because you're so global and you'll, be, you'll have your fingers on the pulse of what's going on in sports in the Arab world or, or what's going on in Britain and Europe, you will, I'm sure, have very firmly on your radar screen all the various scandals that we all do in different ways. Um, well, the, the, that's a great point. But the big news in the U.S. in that in that area is that college players are, they're going to take a vote uh, next season if they can sell their rights now. Selling their rights now, they, they've got a full ride to a, to a, a, a university but they're able to sell their rights to, um, you know, like uh, uh, Sony for uh, game station. And, and, and so if they become very well known, uh, they, that will be another generate revenue generation for them, if that makes sense. So it's the, the, the American system is so big on revenue, excellence, uh, individual uh, wealth, kind of that it there's nothing wrong with that but it's a system that doesn't self-regulate itself and if it can't self-regulate then we get things like mental health concussion issues yeah. um uh yeah just it just builds you know the the kneeling yeah. uh, you know that that 
it's really hard to understand for a lot of people why the kneeling's happening and it turns into a black white debate of course okay. yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be how interesting john we're going to press on we have questions coming in okay so yes. uh, graham to panelists if the quality of the leadership is coming backwards or stuck in a rut what does that say about the culture of the sports organization or the expectations of the fans and individuals who want to win consistently wow that's a big one <laughs> thank you graham well first of all I, I, uh, the 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 coaching or the leadership doesn't go backwards it just stays so maybe at some point it was it had capacity and the capability to do something whatever it was maybe win but what happens is that life life conditions change and move on and and it's up to the organization and the coach to develop that capacity to continue. Uh, um, the, the idea of, uh, of, of you know, winning all the time, really interesting. Uh, you know, in the 19th and 20th century, it, 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 and actually now, if you look at the management crisis in English football, it's about winning. And if you don't, you're out. Uh, and I think that that needs to shift. Not every, I like what uh, Jose Mourinho said, um, not every club can win. And, and, and it's very true because there are so many different elements that, that, uh, um, that we don't see behind the club, finance, management capacity, off pitch. Then there's the on pitch. It's literally having to uh, organize these elements in a way that you do get wins. I mean, um, uh, and then you get, you know, you have the types like Sir Alice Ferguson that is out of this world that, um, you know, but that's one in a million. Um, and uh, there, there are other coaches like that, uh, but it, it's, it's, um, there needs to be another way to really look at the quality of leadership and coaching other than winning. Yeah, almost maybe a more holistic approach of which winning is a part. But it's only one dimension of the yes, prison. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, um, uh, uh, Elizabeth Joy Power. Uh, very thought provoking subject matter and how leadership management theoretical models can be applied within the field of sport. Thank you for that comment. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, if we have more questions, that would be brilliant. I'm, I'm going through there. Um, John, my question to you is you're describing individuals. At the, at the you know at the heart of these sports people who love their sports we touched on exploitation and we've touched on on the bad things you've touched on mental health bame issues you mentioned gender issues you you, you produced that wonderful almost periodic table earlier which yes. you feel like yes. it, you know just the you know the word you're describing is a microcosm of all the problems we have everywhere as if these chemical particles are colliding in sport like nowhere else. But at the root of it, when you talk about individuals who go in, there are potentially fabulous amounts of money, they're being exploited, they go to college, they get sponsored, they're on a cable TV, you know, but they can't read or write. But then, right. then they're gonna be, these people are gonna be able, you know, are gonna be expected to judge, and that's the key thing, to judge whether they're gonna have a good deal with one of the big media companies. This sort of, um, represents an extreme almost form of commodification of the individual. I'm using slightly Marxist terminology, but that was the commodification. It's almost the science fiction kind of version of commodification where their image, their output, you know, is owned. But that's the kind of world we're entering now because gone are the world of the traditional broadcaster. We as each individual are potentially our own sort of broadcasters. We're living in a million to million channel world where if I want to have my tweet and my YouTube, etc., so Tim Evans can be a commodified brand. That's okay if if you're John, because John, you know, is a, is a highly educated, you know, guy who's very successful. Um, but if you're, you know, perhaps a young person without experience or without the education or the backup to be able to make the judgment calls, then how on earth can you do this? So I'm, I'm, I have to say, I mean, there is a side to your talk where I'm quite shocked 
by not only the collision of so many particles, because I didn't fully appreciate it, but also um, this extreme commodification and this really dark, dangerous rapaciousness, which can clearly utterly destroy people. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, I think <laughs> the US is a culture individualistic where that can easily emerge. And I think in other places now, well, now with social media, you know, have these, these, these social media influencers, and I, and I think it's, it's starting to emerge in other places. Um, but in sports, because it has so much behind it, it's, it's just accentuated, it's, it's multiplied. Uh, and it's interesting though, because you go to other sports, Welsh rugby, right? Or the All Blacks. And there's more of a collectiveness there. Okay. And that's a really interesting, uh, that, that's really, that's interesting to look at, especially that, and that type of sports leadership mindset within that. So, so you could, I, I know that there's a, uh, um, there's a comedy series with uh, a U.S. football coach coming over to, to England to coach. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a funny one. I think it's called Ted Lasso or something like that. Okay. It's, it's comedy, but I think it would be very hard for an American coach to understand the elements of, of, of the, the culture here okay. um, because it is, it's steeped in, uh, you know, it's very deep, um, especially the rugby world. Okay. Uh, uh, and Is there a greater uh, sense of solidarity, John? Uh, a greater uh, sense of, of the team transcending the individual in, in a way? Yeah. Yeah. In a way, it's rather like it being in the army, isn't it? In the army um, or, or the military, I guess you're taught the unit is greater than the individual. Um, is there some sort of intrinsic sense of collect collectivity and solidarity that are embedded in, for example, Welsh rugby that, 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 that you just don't find in some parts of the world, particularly the individualistic bits of the US? Yeah, I, I, I definitely think so. And okay. and one, we can look at the life conditions in Wales and how those emerged and how that, uh, you know, integrates within Welsh rugby and the history and, and, and same with the All Blacks. And there is a there's a collectiveness there. Um, I, a, a U.S. coach um, asked me, how can we get the how can we be like the All Blacks? I want to be like the, you know, that 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 tribal and I, and you know, that tribal spirit. And I said, well, you know, you gotta wait for a couple hundred years to build that. <laughs> it's, it's, you can't make that in a season. Um, especially when a player, if you're a star player on a team in the pros, you get your own plane. You take your own plane to games. You don't go with the, sometimes you don't go with the, the, the regular team because you're a star. Um, and there's this, which, you know, it, 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 it's, it's just a different mindset. It's not bad or good, but it's just what it is. I, I think um, one of the biggest factors in why rugby has maintained this collectiveness is because there hasn't been a lot of cash injection. Cash finances changes a lot. Yeah. Um, when you start seeing the numbers on sponsorship, the numbers in, uh, uh, you know, TV rights, uh, uh, it's, it gets really crazy and that kind of, it, it's a really good developer of a system, but, uh, if that's not self-regulated, it's out of control. Yeah. 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 Um, a, another question, um, is you're a professor and you're a professor at, at, at another British university at, at Bedford. And you know that we at Middlesex, we have, we have the London Sports Institute, um, and, uh, we do a huge amount of work in the sports sciences. We have you know, great partnerships with our neighbours at Saracens and we have great facilities and all the rest of it. But um, whenever societies, particularly industrial societies, have faced problems, often the academy um, has had a huge role to play. You know, you can have, yeah. you can have uh, all kinds of... Um, uh, powerful people in opinion-forming circles. You can have advocates on your side. 
in Congress, the House of Lords, House of Commons, wherever, you can, in politics, you can have journalists who understand these problems, who get it, and you can have people, of course, in the world of management. But often when societies face huge problems, and we saw it with the vaccine and the way Oxford University, for example, has played a, a global role in that area, something they're very strong on, um, a lot comes down to the academy. And well, within academies, it comes down to people like you, me and our colleagues and all the staff as well as the students. So my question is, what role does the academy have? And, and I don't simply mean British universities or American, but as sports science spreads and it, you know, and, and, and sports are increasingly studied at universities right around the world, along with communications media, these are important subjects because they they take up huge amounts of resource and and time and of our thinking. So it's quite right that you should be embedded within curriculum and opportunities. But, but what role do you think the Academy has to help us, if it's possible, err away, get off the beach and out of the woods of your perfect storm just in time? Or if there is a perfect storm and it's all thrown up in the air and there's lots of debris, to what extent can they be part of a rescue party? How do you think of it, I suppose? Great question. I, I think of it as there, there, there are um, it, traditionally in sports, you uh, as a leader or coach, you really didn't take a management course or a business course, uh, especially in the uh, a lot of coaches from the 70s and 80s came from a military background. Hence, hence the <laughs> the sergeant approach and the yelling and because that's really all that was that was there for, for them to learn. Um, and there's some great examples though of, uh, uh, of Laura Coe, for example, who came out of, came out of sports and, and slowly uh, integrated within the business world and developed these capacities to be able to uh, understand both sides. And I think it's, uh, it, it's really important now, uh, especially in English football where the FA is at the moment, there's not a lot of education as in business and leadership that has gone on to support that. There's a lot of, you know, get your badges, technical, tactical, et cetera, and then try to, then you're dumped in the deep end. Uh, uh, but um, in, in other sports there, th there's that supportive net there of, of the business side of learning how to have a critical conversation, learning how to, uh, uh, control your temper, or et cetera. So I, I, I think academy has a role in in helping business, helping excuse me, sports see where those deficits are, where the support is needed, where the develop is is needed, and and really make practical. Uh, sports people are are they 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 have a hard time sitting down, <laughs> and 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 doing the, uh, the the kind of academic work and. It needs to be practice-based. It needs to be practical for them to try it out, to be able to. So it's a, it's actually a different kind of curriculum as well. Um, as, as you know, the 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 curriculum, the traditional educational curriculum of sitting and learning and taking notes, and you know that, that's slowly diminishing. And uh, so it's the practice-based support in skills where there are gaps. Brilliant. The last question, the very last question has to be uh, to strike an optimistic note. Um, yes. And, you know, give us some reasons to be cheerful. Uh, humanity has a great history of coming through all kinds of storms and crises. You know, I mean, I look back at the last century, I look at the world my grandparents, you know, kind of lived in. You know, they went through the First World War, the Second World War, the Cold War you know, the atomic bomb in 1945, all the, but they also saw the development of radio and TV and aeroplanes, and they saw humanity landing on the moon, and they saw um, the end of wars and of Germany being recreated and becoming an economic and social power, and the same with Japan. You know, however bad it gets, there's always reasons to be cheerful. And I'd like you, if you will, perhaps yes. maybe to be cheerful, but maybe paint some pictures about what good can come from us overcoming all these things. Because we all work and we all do our best in life. 
but we actually don't work uh, for money. Money is a means. What we do at the end of the rainbow is we like to watch TV, go to the theatre, enjoy our sports, have leisure, yeah. do sports ourselves. So your entire field, you know, of your passion, your history, your study, what you write about, what you talk about, you, you, you're lucky in the sense of you get to talk about the gold that's at the end of all our rainbows, the stuff we work to go and do or see. So can you give us some cheery conclusion about why it'll all be all right in the end? Yes, I, I wrote, uh, the last chapter of my book is about knife crime. Okay. And I explain how sport, sport is, is forgive me if anyone's religious out there, <laughs> but sport is, is as, uh, it's a huge healer. And right. um, I actually wrote in my book that it is, is it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a developmental conveyor belt. So right. at, at developmental parts in a human's life, when they're young and starting to grow, there's certain things that you can do with sports. Sports are fun. It's playful. It's natural. And if you can build these into uh, a system, for example, solving knife crime, there are some great examples of boxing clubs, right? Getting kids off the street, getting them away from drugs. And it's a natural way of a teen to get out the stress and, and, and feel good about themselves. And so I, I think uh, sport is a healer. We, we, and it's a great tool. We just have to know how to use it as a solution and where. Uh, I was, um, I, I, I think it was about two years ago when I think the government cut basketball out mm -hmm. of the, the, the whole entire maybe curriculum or, uh, and, and you, you think, you know, okay, fine. Professional, let's forget about it. But basketball is so easy to do. You put up a hoop, and you start playing, bouncing a ball. It's like, kind of like soccer, right? You get a pitch and a ball and, and you start, and use taking that or taking a sport into areas where are deprived, where there's a high rate of uh, crime. Um, it, it can be used stealthfully as a solution to get people on, to move them on. Um, and if you read a lot of uh, biographies of, of famous sports people, it's exactly what happened. They started, uh, they, they had mental health issues, they had uh, depression issues uh, or family issues, um, and they just focused on something that they could move their body with, getting into competitions, uh, training now. So it, it's kind of like a, it's a pathway, developmental pathway, because each time you're, you're doing something to improve. And that's where that's where um, that's my happy note on sport. <laughs> John, thank you so much. You've been beyond brilliant. It's been an absolute pleasure and a delight. And as always, whenever you and I get together or we talk, and we're going to get together for lunch, we hope this summer. Um, I yeah. always learn so much from you, and I'm so appreciative. And um, you might not be particularly familiar with Middlesex University, but uh, we are one of the world's most fifth, leading 15 diverse universities. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, a brilliant London Sports Institute, which I think is very highly regarded. And so many of the subtexts and the themes that you've articulated so brilliantly tonight chime with the whole ethos and spirit of what we are about. So it has been an absolute delight to host you. Can I also, again, thank Christian who I think you and I, John, would agree has been beyond brilliant at supporting us uh, through this yes. and making all of this happen uh, in such a seamless uh, and brilliant way. Um, and all my colleagues, Anna Cipriano and Kim Raymond and so many others behind the scenes. Um, uh, I'd also like to say, and I'm just going to whet people's appetite with two things. Uh, towards the end of April, and we'll be sending details out about this shortly, um, we hope to have Will Page uh, talking about tiger economics. Will is the former uh, chief economist at Spotify. Uh, that's a brand um, uh, that is certainly beloved of my daughter and of younger people, and I'm getting to grips with it myself. So it'll be great to have Will talking about uh, economics and his 
recent uh, book, sorry, it's Tarzan Economics, sorry about that. Um, uh, and also, and John, I hope you would come back and maybe listen to this, uh, later this year, and I'm not going to name the person uh, just at the moment because it is being confirmed, but we do hope, and I bracket expect, uh, to have um, a very dear friend um, from Qatar uh, speak, who is actually uh, the key organiser of the uh, Football World Cup next yes. year. And he does an awful lot on the global media. He was recently interviewed by CNN. Um, and I have had a gentle nod that he would be happy to speak to Middlesex University uh, as doing a distinguished lecture. And he'd be more than happy for British sports journalists to be present, where he will give us an update um, on how the World Cup is coming along for next year and what we can expect. I think it's natural because uh, at Middlesex, we are so diverse. We have lots of friends from the Middle East, but also, of course, uh, Britain is the home of, as you would call it, soccer. So that should be a perfect. <laughs> John, thank you for joining us. We're going to end a recording now, and you were brilliant. Thank you.